It's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host for tonight, Heather Cook. I'm a sophomore at the College of Worcester studying political science and history, and I work as a visitor service associate at the Baird Crawford Museum while not in school. And tonight I'm joining you live from my dorm in Worcester, Ohio. Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of the Berenger Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors, including the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph B. Hale Jr. Foundation, as well as our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining us. For access to discounts and exclusive programming, you can learn more and join at our website, bcmuseum.org. Before we begin, let's go over a few reminders. If you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat or the Q&A feature, and we will try to get to as many as possible immediately following the presentation. There will also be a quiz question tonight and the first respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat on Zoom or Facebook Live will win a Northern Kentucky History Hour prize and most importantly, bragging rights. So that question for tonight is, during which battle was Marquis de Lafayette wounded? Um, and we will go ahead and put that in the chat um, once we get started. So let's meet tonight's speaker. Carl Littenmeyer is a longtime member of the Kenton County H Historical Society and has edited and produced Northern Kentucky Heritage Magazine for over 25 years. He has also promoted and documented Northern Kentucky history in many other ways, as a researcher, advisor, tour guide, and writer. He has encouraged the preservation of original documents and photographs and helped start an intern program for budding historians. Thank you so much, Carl, for joining us. Also, before we get started, we did have an error in our release it should have read 1824 instead of 1864. Um, so we do apologize for that. And if you are ready, Carl, you can go ahead and begin tonight's presentation. Thank you very much. Glad to have you, <clears throat> glad to be here. Um, I have always been fascinated and uh, impressed with, with Lafayette and uh, so, so much so that I wrote a lengthy article that was published in Northern Kentucky Heritage a long time ago, which you can find on our website if you would care to read further. Well, okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> Lafayette was born to privilege in 1757 at his home called the Chateau de Chavagnac. And he is a descendant of ancient French noble family and his, uh, brace yourself, his full name is Marie Joseph Paul Yves Roche Gilbert de Montier de Lafayette. Um, he is known to uh, his friends as Gilbert or Gilbert. Uh, so, but we all call him Lafayette or Marquis de Lafayette. Now, Lafayette's birthplace, as you see, this is a picture of the Chateau de Chavagnac. It's in south central France below uh, Paris, south of Paris. Okay, so the next one is his father, Michel Christophe de Montier, was killed in the Seven Years' War when Gilbert, or Gilbert, I should say, was two years old. Uh, his mother <clears throat> raised him. Also, his paternal grandmother and aunts moved. She moved to Paris after her husband's death. And <clears throat> she died, leaving um, Gilbert an orphan at the age of 13. But his grandmother, particularly, uh, uh, told him or read him stories of chivalry, and he became very, very idealistic in his attitude. He would <clears throat> often pretend to be a quixotic character fighting evil. And so when he was of college age, she, she, sent, <clears throat> she sent him to Plessis. Uh, the College du Plessis is the same college <laughs> that Robespierre attended. 
Uh, I don't know if it was at the same time, however. All right, so we'll go to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> um, he married Adrienne de Noé. She was 14 years old and Gilbert was 16. The Noé family was quite influential and wealthy and, uh, and powerful. His father was the Duke de An, that's spelled D apostrophe A Y E N. Now, while he, after his marriage, he joined uh, a <clears throat> the uh, private army or the uh, uh, the regiment called the Noé Dragoons. So he writes this way: he says, when my wife's family obtained a place for me at court. I did not hesitate to be disagreeable to preserve my independence. It was while I was in that frame of mind that I first heard of the troubles in America. So go on, next one. Now, <clears throat> Silas Dean, whom you may or may not heard, was sent to France to sign up French uh, fighters. He signed up Lafayette on December the 12th, 1776, but he was swamped by French volunteers, nobles, generals, and even bishops unemployed in their homeland wanted to go to America to fight for freedom. This was in the days <clears throat> when Montesquieu was writing uh, about the, and during the age of enlightenment, so they were very uh, hopped up on this uh, freedom thing and, and um, democracy. King Louis discouraged American involvement at this time for fear of inciting war with Britain. Now, he, uh, he really discouraged most of the uh, uh, minor nobility from going, but Lafayette insisted and purchased his own vessel, leaving his pregnant wife and sailed with other noble volunteers. And while on the ship, studied English and military tacky, tactics before he got to America. He wrote Adrienne a letter asking forgiveness for keeping his plans secret. He told her the welfare of America was intimately connected with the happiness of all mankind. So you can see how idealistic this person was. On June 13th, let me go to the next one, I think. Uh, he lands at <clears throat> Major Ben Benjamin Hogan's plantation near Georgetown, South Carolina. He was a Huguenot. French family in America. And shortly he arrived at Charleston. The whole entourage purchased horses and wagons for the 900 mile trip to Philadelphia. You can imagine the poor roads made traveling exhausting. A lot of the horses died. Uh, not all the volunteers were received well, especially those from Santo Domingo. They arrived with an arrogant attitude and um, they were really the natural or <clears throat> minor nobility. He writes in his memoirs, Lafayette says, our reception could not have been more uncivil. A gentleman, actually the Congressman Lovell from <clears throat> Massachusetts, received us in the street where he left us after calling us adventurers in very good French also. He said, last year we did lack officers, but this year we have plenty and all are experienced. Now I mention all this because Lafayette seems to be an exception. Now Congress, <clears throat> Lafayette's reception to, to, the, to the Continental Congress it was different due to his personality. He read aloud to the Congress 
After the sacrifices I have made, I have the right to exact two favors. One is to serve at my own expense, and the other is to begin as a volunteer. Congress accepts this argument and appoints Lafayette a major general to General Washington's staff. Washington is immediately attracted to Lafayette's modest demeanor and devotion to the American cause. He considers Washington his father since he lost his at such a young age. And of course, you know, Washington had no children of his own. So he gets a command at Brandywine Creek and as a 20 year old Lafayette found himself in the front lines of this most significant battle, rallying retreating troops when he was hit in the calf. After his boot filled with blood, he exited the field. Now, by 1778, France signs an alliance with the Americans, negotiated by Ben Franklin. And Lafayette lobbied the French government hard. So King Louis' minister says, uh, King Louis, the minister Maripal says, Lafayette would sell the furniture at Versailles to clothe American troops. They really got a little, um, um, pressure from Lafayette. All right, so Lafayette in 79 re returns to Paris with dispatches for American commissioners that would be Franklin and Adams and the letter of thanks for King Louis XVI. So in 1780 in the spring, he returns to America. You can go to the next slide, I think. Uh, he lands in Boston and sees a low morale. Americans are uplifted by his return because he's already um, uh, has already impressed Americans. The king gives Lafayette the privilege to first tell Washington of French force under Rochambeau. All right, so during Yorktown, <clears throat> he uh, he, he is uh, leading the whole one side of, of the troops. And when Cornwallis surrenders, when boxed in by the French fleet under de, Ga de Gras. Um, after the war is over, he, Lafayette offers his assistance to the peace negotiations, but the Americans are not that comfortable with a Frenchman <laughs> in assistance. So, okay, we'll go to the next slide. All right, after the revolution, this is a picture of, of the medal for the Society of the Cincinnati. Um, hopefully you have heard of it. But <clears throat> Washington resigns his commission and returns to Mount Vernon, as we all know. Lafayette writes to him saying, the conduct you have had on that occasion was highly praised throughout all of Europe. Most thought he would be a king or a Cromwellian character at best. Your returning to a private station is calling the finishing stroke to an unparalleled character. Never did a man exist who so honorably stood in the opinions of mankind. Now, Henry Knox founds the Society of the Cincinnati and open, that was open to all French and American officers. The society was hereditary, which shocked John Adams because he thought that Lafayette had founded it, which he did not. Okay. Now, he visited in 1784, after returning from France to France for a while, Lafayette's last visit to Washington at Mount Vernon. He advocates a stronger union than the Confederation articles that were in force at the time. James Madison traveled with Lafayette on and looking, uh, visiting 10 states. And Lafayette spoke of three hobby horses, as he called them, a Franco-American alliance, stronger federal union, which did come later, and the manumission of slaves. 
There's the issue. Okay, on to the next. He returns to France during the, and the French Revolution begins. <clears throat> the storming of the Bastille, <clears throat> Lafayette is seen as keeper of public order as a member of the Etat General. It, that becomes the National Assembly. As is the case for most moderates, he is suspected both by the king and by the revolutionaries. He is enlisted as a leader of the revolutionaries, much like American Minutemen. He designs their uniform and what will become the national French flag, the tricolore. He orders the destruction of the Bastille and sends the key to Mount Vernon, where it is on display, as you see, to this very day. When the king and the assembly arrive in Paris, the Lafayette is wedged between protecting citizens, protecting the king, and keeping order. As you see, the king is now arrested, and Lafayette becomes his jailer. Now, so with, most, with many revolutions, it degenerates into the terror. So <clears throat> there, a, a war with Austria begins and Lafayette accepts a command of troops for that war. And he is wedged between Robespierre and the king. The king is deposed, Austrians capture Lafayette and in 1793 through 98, Adrienne, Lafayette, and their daughters are imprisoned for five years by the Austrians. Lafayette's property is seized in France. Adrienne's family is guillotined. Adrienne and Lafayette's life are spared by petitions only from Americans. Monroe, James Monroe, is now ambassador to France. And uh, the Lafayette family is released through their work. Now, on to the next. This is a picture of Adrienne's property, the Noel, the Noe Lagrange uh, estate. Now, Napoleon is on the throne. He lifts the interdict of Lafayette and he can come home to France. Adrienne's neglected property, the Lagrange, as you see here, is restored and Lafayette's family retires to Lagrange. He does not accept positions in Napoleon's government. And he says, quote, if Bonaparte had been willing to serve the cause of liberty, I should have been devoted to him, but I can neither approve of an arbitrary government nor associate myself with it. So you see he be, he's maintaining his idealistic attitudes. Well, during this time, Jefferson is offering Lafayette American acreage. He declines that and then Adrian dies. So, and he's elected to the French assembly. Everybody is suspicious of Lafayette because he's so idealistic. All right, now he's defeated for American for re-election and Albert Gallatin, who is now the ambassador to France, this is not Albert Gallatin, however, um, invites Lafayette to America. Now we're going to get to the story of what he does here. President James Monroe encourages it and Congress confirms his invite. Lafayette is now <clears throat> age 67. He sells his livestock, borrows some money and books passage. He has <clears throat> broken his leg in France and walks with a limp with the help of a cane. He brings his son, George Washington de Lafayette, a friend, Monsieur de Sion, a steward, valet, Bastian and secretary Auguste Levasseur, whose notes were later published. The entire United States was excited about Lafayette's visit. 
probably no visitor in the history of America received such a welcome. He was overwhelmed by America's excitement and his tour added a word to the American lexicon to be fated comes from his <laughs> the word fayette has given an extravagant welcome. He visited every state, all 24 of them at the time. Now, turn to the next one. <clears throat> this is a map of his tour, which starts up in Boston, goes across the Great Lakes, down through Pennsylvania, over to the coast, all through the south, into New Orleans, and <clears throat> By 1825, the company boarded the Natchez steamboat in New Orleans and sailed for St. Louis. He took the Natchez to the Cumberland River to Nashville to visit Andrew Jackson. Now, don't forget, <clears throat> this is a time of crisis for politics because Jackson had just lost to John Quincy Adams through a the only time that the president was chosen by the Congress. Uh, so also you have to remember that the slavery issue was becoming more and more prominent with the passage of the Missouri Compromise of 1820. So things were a little bit upsetting in America over that. And I think that Lafayette's visit calmed things down a lot. Surely he spoke to Jackson concerning his bitter disappointment at the election. And um, so after he visited Nashville, he goes back to the Ohio and <clears throat> boards a steamboat by the name of the Mechanic, who the French called the L'Artisan. Now, to near Louisville, it hits a snag and founders. Snags were a, a destroyer of steamboats. Steam had only been in use since 1811, and most of the rivers were still uncleared of trees and stumps. Levasseur's notes describes the event. And this is an exciting thing here because they're on a sinking steamboat. As the steamboat paddled up the Ohio River, against the four mile current. The Marquis was busy replying to some 600 unanswered letters. He was in his cabin asleep by 10. At midnight, he was awakened by a terrible shock. The boat suddenly stopped. George Washington de Lafayette leapt out of bed and with Le Vasseur rushed on deck to see what happened. The captain looked into the hold and cried, a snag, a snag, quick get Lafayette and bring him to my skiff. He was calmly dressing with the aid of his valet Bastien when Levasseur entered his cabin. What news? Lafayette asked. We are sinking, mon general, replied Levasseur, and must not waste a moment. Georges and he urged the general to go on deck, but Bastien had not yet dressed him. He told them to go and he would follow. What, exclaimed George, do you think we would leave you for an instant? They snatched up a few important papers and seizing him by the arm, led him to the door. He smiled at their haste, but followed. Then halfway up the stairs, he turned back. In despair, they asked him where he was going down again. But my snuff box, he exclaimed, I left it on my table. It was a snuff box that bore the miniature of Washington and Levasseur ran back to get it. The boat was lurching terribly and on deck the 50 odd passengers in terror were rushing toward the one lifeboat. The night was so black that they could see nothing and the mechanic already had an alarming list to starboard. The confusion was so great they could not reach the rail. Levasseur shouted to the crowd, here is General Lafayette. The desired effect was produced. The crowd opened a passage for him, but he declared that all others must be saved first. Here he goes with his idealism. 
The passengers insisted on his getting into the skiff with his stiff leg, it was a ticklish business. Two men took him under their arms, Levasseur leaped into the skiff and they lowered him over the side and rowed the group to Kentucky shore. But when the Marquis realized that Georges, his son, was not there, he calm, his calm demeanor left him and he called, George, George. The mechanic was on her beam, <clears throat> beam ends by now. Levasseur took a dozen persons and rowed them ashore, but Georges was not among them, nor a French companion, Monsieur de Sion, nor Bastien. Levasseur rowed back to the port side, still out of the water, and called out for Georges. Finally, a voice was heard. Is that you, Monsieur Levasseur? Bastien and Georges were clinging to the side. Georges remained until all passengers were rescued. On shore, his father embraced George and all passengers were accounted for. A mattress had floated ashore and the old campaigner lay down on it and calmly went to sleep. The Paragon, a fine steamer, was coming downriver in the morning, heading to New Orleans with a cargo of whiskey and tobacco. Its owner happened to be on board the mechanic and requested his paragon to turn around and pick up all and sail north to Louisville. Another example of American esteem or Lafayette, reroute the steamboat to assist. So as you see here, his first stop was Louisville in May of 1825. The population then was 5,500 people. Lafayette embraced comrades he had not seen in 40 years, and the crowd was 10,000 people in the streets of Louisville. Then <clears throat> an entourage of, of um, wagons and horses and uh, an honor guard of, of soldiers on white horses accompanied them to Shelbyville. Population then was 1,200. Heavy rain made roads difficult, requiring stopping at Megawan's Tavern in Shelbyville. Militia from surrounding towns added to the parade. And then to Frankfurt, the capital. Its population then was 2,000. Lafayette makes a speech at the public square and festivities culminated in a formal dinner with speeches and toasts by dignitaries and governors. <clears throat> the picture that you saw before was actually our governor uh, who was accompanying Lafayette at the time. Versailles, or Versailles as we call it, population was 900 at the time. He arrived there in May 15th. It was an outdoor barbecue and meeting of old revolutionary friends and the rain finally subsided. Then to Lexington, population was 6,000. Reception at the Keene Mansion. Today, that's Keeneland Racetrack. Major John Keene served with Lafayette. In the area of revolutionary veterans all gathered at Keene's home. Ball and reception at the Masonic Hall and all traveled <clears throat> the entourage traveled up present US 25, which at the time was a, a dirt road. Georgetown <clears throat> is not even mentioned in the 1820 census, but it had grown to 1300 people by 1830. It was an unscheduled stop to visit US Senator Richard Mentor Johnson, who uh, you historians will know that he was vice president under Van Buren um, and his home still stands in Kentucky, by the way, and spent the night with Senator Johnson. Now, we will go to Cincinnati. He hits Covington, which at the time was, had a population of about 700 people. No reception was planned, but the entire town gathered on May 19th to cheer Lafayette. A brief stop at <coughs> the Connolly Tavern, second and Garrett might have happened. And 
midshipmen uh, were, uh, took Lafayette on a Navy barge called the Yorktown from Newport Barracks and rowed him across the Ohio with a 21 gun salute, band and fireworks. <laughs> now, I will have to say something about the, uh, those people who live in Covington have probably read this historic sign, which has a lot of mistakes in it. One of which is the statement that Lafayette visited it. it he, he did not visit um, the owner of this house whose name <clears throat> was William Southgate. Uh, William Southgate's wife was Adeliza Keene, and that is where he visited Lafayette, or Lafayette visited him, not, <clears throat> not here in Covington. There was a confusion, I guess, in the people who made this sign up who just assumed that they were home, but they were not. They were in Lexington. So uh, I'm the other things, um, Carneal obviously never lived here either. And uh, I, for one, don't understand why it's called Carneal House. Uh, he had very little or nothing to do with this place. He, he owned the land, um, which became Covington and probably sold it and to build this house, which dates to about 1816. Um, I think probably Henry Clay would, would probably have been a legitimate visitor because William Southgate and he were political friends, but I have no idea. I have seen nothing about Daniel Webster or Andrew Jackson visiting here. And um, so that's very doubtful. Okay, now when he gets across, um, well, you can turn, this is another view of, of the Carneal, so-called Carneal House, which we like to call the Gano Southgate House. All right, um, goes, <clears throat> Now the, the um, go back one more. There was a big banquet for Lafayette in Cincinnati. He was anxious to see Cincinnati because it was the namesake of the society that was formed. Um, after he visited Cincinnati, he left May 21st for Maysville and had a short visit at Maysville. Now let's discuss this portrait. This is the Jewett painting, Matthew Harris Jewett. Okay, the Kentucky legislature <clears throat> attribute, uh, paid him $1,500 to paint Lafayette's image, but Jewett missed meeting Lafayette in the East Coast for the sitting. So Lafayette suggested that he copy the Ari Schaefer um, portrait which hangs in the U.S. House in Washington. So Jewett spent time in the U.S. House copying the Schaeffer, Schaeffer painting. Lafayette thought that the Schaeffer painting was his favorite likeness. So this, <clears throat> this painting now hangs in the old, uh, the old State House in Lexington. Those of you who visited the old State, state House will notice that is in the uh, chamber to this very day. Okay, now this is an epilogue for him. After passing the mouth of the Big Sandy River, Lafayette passed forever the borders of Kentucky. He left enduring love and reverence as only Washington himself inspired. At his death in 1834, Funeral honors were paid him throughout the world. Congress ordered the same honors that had been rendered at the death of Washington. Cities, towns, counties, roads were all named after him. Fayette County in Kentucky was the very first named for the general. His name appears today over 100 times on a map. More frequently, than all but only two or three of our own founders. That really says something. Another American practice was naming new settlements after the estates of the founders, Mount Vernon, Monticello, 
Montpelier, now a fourth name, Lagrange, began to appear, such as the town just south of Louisville. That is the story of Lafayette. We did have a winner. Um, uh -huh. So that question was during which battle was Marquis de Lafayette wounded? And the answer, answer was the Battle of Brandywine. And our winner was Tina Eichmann. So we will get your prize to you in the mail. Uh, but in the meantime, while people are getting in questions, do you maybe want to talk about that battle a little bit more? And what exactly happened? Well, um, I don't, I don't know any, much about the, the battle, but the <clears throat> what I find most intriguing about this, um, this man's life and story really needs to be on, in the front lobes of most Americans today because he is such an inspiration to us. This man is not an American. He's a Frenchman who, who, who uh, everybody accepts him as if he were American. And in fact, even more so, um, I find that as extraordinary. Um, if I ever had the chance to go back to that time, that's one person that I would love to have met because he must have been an incredible person considering the amount of nobility that flocked over here to probably take advantage uh, of, of the, the war or whatever in the revolution. Um, and then <clears throat> we're not really welcomed that, <laughs> that much, which I find uh, astounding in itself, particularly since Fran France became one of our closest allies. Uh, if it hadn't been for France, we would have lost. I would think I, I feel pretty confident of that because we we were fighting the, the world's strongest, largest army <laughs> and with a ragtag bunch of guys in shambles. Um, well, but without the French help, I, I don't think we would have made it. <laughs> so um, and Lafayette has a lot to do with that because he uh, he probably got the ear of the king before the king lost his head uh, but uh, um, because you know uh, after a while I'm sure the king liked the fact that uh, we were beating the hell out of Britain because that was his biggest enemy and of course the, the revolution in both instances strained the treasuries of both Britain and France because of the expense that they poured into it, one side or the other. Uh, and I think probably contributed to the French Revolution, I would think, um, because of, uh, of uh, economic problems that was brought on by the spending of troops from uh, Rochambeau and so on that were sent over here. Yeah, so we do have a couple questions. Um, so the first one is, was there a great deal written in the local papers describing his visit? What was that again? Was there a great deal written in the local papers describing his visit? Oh, yes, there was. Um, what papers there were. Um, <clears throat> it's a funny thing about um, in a local paper in Covington, there was a an item that I remember reading that the uh, the the um, council of Covington very much wanted Lafayette to stop in Covington for at least some kind of a celebration, and they were going to go across the river, which had to be done by ferry. Uh, don't forget, there's no bridges um, to invite him to come back across the river, but they thought better of it because there were many, <laughs> several of the council guys uh, of Covington at the time were in debt to Cincinnati businessmen and thought better of it because um, they would have been collared um, for, their, for the debts that they owed uh, some Cincinnati businessmen. So they, they didn't do that, 
even though they really wanted to. That's about the best that I can remember from the newspapers I have. Every newspaper, I'm sure, in the whole nation um, trumpeted his visit. I, I'm positive of that. Yeah. Um, and then someone else is wondering if you can discuss his visit, visit to Federal Hall owned by a Piat. By Piat? Oh. Well, I'm not an expert on the Piats, except it's a very, very old family here in, in Cincinnati area. Uh, Piat Park in Cincinnati is that same family. Um, <clears throat> the Piat House, I don't think it exists anymore. Um, it was a it was stone as I remember, and I do remember being there once, um, and the walls were probably three feet thick, <laughs> so um, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. I I, I know that I remember that, um, but now the question again was what? Um, if you could discuss his visit to Federal Hall owned by a Piat. Um, well, not any, any more than that, I do not know. No, I do not. Sorry. Um, so that's all the questions we have in right now. If anybody wants to get in, um, maybe some more questions. Um, maybe in, I don't know, in the meantime, um, if you want to discuss maybe how you started getting into researching Lafayette? Oh, well, uh, let's see, what, the, what, was, what was the impetus for me to do that? I'm trying to remember. I ended up writing <clears throat> a, um, a rather lengthy article in Northern Kentucky Heritage, which uh, you can find, and it's in, uh, it's in volume 26, number two, and it's indexed on our website uh, as um, part of the Northern Kentucky Heritage Magazine index. Um, <clears throat> I just found him an incredible character, an unusually idealistic character who never lost his idealism. Uh, and I don't know, I, I pride myself on being sort of like that. <laughs> um, but in today's politics, that's not very easy to do. So um, I think that was my impetus. It, it's just such a character. Uh, and I had to find out why he was so quickly accepted um, by Washington and, and America, period, you know, because he just, he was extremely enthused about America, because as I said, the writings of the Enlightenment of people like Montesquieu uh, and Voltaire and people like that, most of it were French writers, even though they still had an absolute monarchy. Um, there, the the age of enlightenment was really burgeoning in that in that time, and the idea of a democracy was just beginning to flourish, um, <clears throat> which ultimately, I guess, became also the French form of government. But I find it interesting that that the tricolore which Lafayette designed was the same colors we have on our own flag, uh, <laughs> red, white, and blue. Um, so he has a love for America that is unparalleled, it seems to me. Yeah, I think Lafayette's super interesting as well, especially how he was friends with both Hamilton and Jefferson. And he was so instrumental in our Revolutionary War and getting both, and yeah. both of it. Both revolutions in France yeah. revolution and getting well. our aid um, because he felt that if America could gain independence, then France could too. Um, we did get a few more questions and comments in. So someone was wondering where was the banquet held in Cincinnati for the general? Oh, the banquet in Cincinnati? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> 
probably could have been Pike's Opera House. I'm not sure whether that was constructed because there was no, there was no music hall, of course, you know, there were a lot of musicians already in Cincinnati. Um, there, there's, um, there's a story about, about um, a, a Kentuckian, uh, Joseph Gosso, uh, Tasso, excuse me, who, uh, who rode as a young man in the entourage of white horses up US 25, which was the Lexington, um, it was called the Covington Lexington Road at the time. Um, and he was a violinist. So there's lots of, there's lots of say uh, urban legends about the fact that um, people make up stuff, as you know, you know, the old telephone game of uh, whispering into someone's ear and then whispering in the next person. And by the time it comes around, it's altogether different. Um, mm. That's what mm. <laughs> urban legends are. Mm. And uh, it's all kinds of crazy stories about, about Joseph Tasso um, playing in, in the symphony when well, there wasn't any symphony in, <laughs> for, for Lafayette's um, uh, uh, celebration it wasn't any symphony, but there were a considerable amount of musicians, and I'm sure they had a, a banquet and a dance for him. I doubt whether he was dancing because because he, he didn't walk very well, uh, as I explained in getting off the sinking ship. <laughs> it took two men uh, and with a guy down below catching him. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure where it was because I never investigated the actual details of what happened in Cincinnati, which really was his his favorite place to go because of the name. Um, yeah, we do have a couple comments too um, that we'd like to share. Ben Barlage said that he read recently that. His, um, Lafayette's 1825 carriage was subsequently purchased by the Studebaker company and was on display for years. Oh my. Um, mm. And he also said that General Harrison was in Cincinnati to welcome Lafayette. And oh yes, that's great. Right. Um, yes. Welcome then companion of Washington, friend of Franklin, of Adams and Jefferson, devoted champion of liberty, welcome. Yes, that's right. I forgot about that. That's true, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, he had he had the governor, uh, Governor Desha um, of Kentucky and the Governor Carroll of of t Tennessee. And I believe Indiana, Indiana's governor also came, came over to Cincinnati. So there were three states governors that I know of that were there at that festival. And um... We did have a response on uh, the federal hall owned by the Pyatt. They said that oh, it's it is ruins located near where 275 goes into Indiana. Right. Um, I, I didn't, yeah, uh, uh, you're right. There is ruins there, but it's no longer habitable. Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. And if we don't have any more questions, oh, what did his son do later in life? Lafayette's son. Do you know um, what his oh, I'm not sure. I don't know. That's something I should I should really research because I don't know. He had two daughters and George. I think those were the three his three children. I believe that's correct. And I honestly do not know um, what happened to his descendants. I really don't. I mean, he <clears throat> he's buried in Ferris with American soil and that he brought with him. So uh, um, I, I, that's something I should know, but I do not. Um, so we don't have any more questions in right now. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss before we wrap up? Okay. 
you have anything else you want to ask? Well, <laughs> I invite you all to uh, go to the website of the Kenton County Historical Society. We're very, very proud of it, just as BC is with theirs. Um, we have, if uh, you need to know something about something of, of Kentucky local history, um, we have 40 years of newsletters, all scanned and indexed, plus uh, 25 years of Northern Kentucky Heritage magazines indexed, which are about to be scanned. Some of them we're going to put on the first five years of the magazines. We never had them scanned before. So we're gonna um, put, put the first five years of the magazine online so that you can see them. Uh, but you can still order back paper copies of the magazine. There, there are back issues of most magazines still available for you if there's a subject that you find that you wanna know about in detail. We do have some great comments. Um, thanking you for your knowledge and of us important friends of our country and a great presentation. You're um, welcome. You're welcome. Glad to do it. And if we don't have any more questions coming in, I guess we will go ahead and wrap up. So we do have a few promotions. Um, BCMs having Holly Jolly Days. Uh, coming to the museum from November 12th through January 8th. We will be featuring Irving Berlin's White Christmas, the exhibit, featuring costumes, studio props, and more from the holiday classic White Christmas, as well as the return of our beloved holiday toy trains in Winter Wonderland in Nature Play at BCM. You can learn more at our website, bcmuseum.org. Also, we are searching for local vendors um, to showcase and sell their products to guests in a special Behringer's Bazaar holiday market, uh, Saturday, November 19th from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. We are looking for a variety of high quality handmade one of a kind gift items, such as artworks, custom pieces, holiday themed items, etc. cetera. Um, interested participants can contact the BCM Assistant Director, Sean Mandel, at S Mendel, which is S M E N D E L L at bcmuseum.org, or by calling 859 491 4003. Our next Northern Kentucky History Hour will be on November 16th with Rosemary Clooney Museum owner and former Miss America, Heather French Henry, exploring oh Irving Berlin's White Christmas, the exhibit. For more Northern Kentucky history through the week, you can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest installment of our curator's chats with our curator of collections, Jason French, as well as any past Northern Kentucky history hours that you may have missed. Please like and subscribe on those videos. And that's all we have for this evening. So thank you all again to our sponsors and supporters of BCM. Please take care and good night. Thanks everyone.